This is Sienna, and you are listening to the King of the Mountain Podcast. Hi, this is Allie, and you're listening to the King of the Mountain Podcast. Right, one to the two, two to the three, in a place to be. It's the King of the Mountain podcast talking Destination X this week. Thanks for swinging by if you're a returning listener. If you're a new listener, whatever platform you were listening on, please hit that subscribe button. So if it's Podbean, it's iTunes, it's YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you are listening on iTunes slash Apple Podcasts, I would love a five-star rating and uh, some nice comments, nice little review there. Would appreciate that much. If you are listening on YouTube, Please hit that subscribe button. I'm on the road to uh, 900 subscribers at the moment. And as I talk to you right now, I'm at 841. So uh, trying to hit 900 within the next few days. Shouts out to all my podcasting colleagues out there, especially the Heelcast, because they always have something really nice to say about me every episode that they do. So shouts out to them. Shouts out to the Impact Heads and anyone who's fighting the good fight. And trying to provide a good show for the Global Force Wrestling fan. If you are on Facebook, hit up Impact Wrestling FZ. So that's facebook.com slash Impact Wrestling FZ. That's the Impact Fan Zone. I am an admin there. And what's really great about that site, it's really the only place that the Global Force Wrestling fan can go to right now and get a get spoiler-free... Um, posts and content and even if there is a spoiler it, it will let you know don't click on the comments if you don't want a spoiler so i had to leave a group today that i was heavily involved with because uh after two or three spoilers um i know people are real proud of themselves when they have that information but it's not fun for me and for a lot of people so i just said screw it and i left the group and uh so fan zone is really really the number one place to be the Sienna and Ali interviews are up on the YouTube channel, and I got a lot of really good feedback for the most part on them, but I do want to speak on them a little bit. Um, I got to go on a little bit of a rant here before we start the uh, start the podcast and talk Destination X. I understand that before the record button is pressed, when I'm conducting these interviews, there is a conversation between myself and the guest on what kind of interview is going to be conducted, what is off limits, and what is safe to ask. Yes, I want to conduct the type of interview that the fans and the listeners want to hear, but I also pride myself in conducting the type of interview that the wrestlers want to give. My first interview with Robbie E, for instance, we didn't really have a good conversation beforehand. He treated it as a work interview. And I'm not saying I like to do these hard shoot interviews. I'd like to do something in the middle. But for me, that interview wasn't fun. And, you know, he wanted to stay in character, but he's not Rosemary. I get if I had Rosemary on the show, that's kind of a different ballgame. My overall intention is to conduct an interview that is conducive to a wrestler's on-screen persona and is respectful of their on-screen character. So, for example... The questions that I asked Sienna fit the Sienna character. The questions I asked Allie fit the Allie character. I'm not going to ask Allie, you know, like I did with Sienna. I'm not going to ask Allie what she thinks about the internet marks and the trolls. I'm going to ask someone like her the kind of questions that are important to her. Like her YouTube channel is important to her. Freaking drinking coffee, being a vegan. That's what's important to Ali, and if you can't find some kind of interest in that, then you're probably you know not really a fan of Ali. Most wrestlers hate doing podcasts, and both of these ladies enjoyed my interview very much. And there's no doubt in my mind that I couldn't hit them up a month or two from now and say, "Hey, would you come back on the show?" or "Hey, could you help me get someone on my show?" There's no doubt in my mind that I can do that because my intention is to build and strengthen relationships with my guests beyond the show. A lot of podcasts will conduct an interview with a wrestler and they never speak again because they're complete strangers. I like to think that I'm kind of building a friendship. I mean, no one's going to each other's house for Thanksgiving, but I like to think that I'm building a friendship. And the best way for me to ruin that is to conduct the kind of interview that they don't want to be a part of. They were both very specific. And this is this is the kind of interview here. You know, giving me some examples. I don't want to talk about this. I don't want it to be this. Ali said the reason she doesn't do podcasts is because they blindside her with questions that she doesn't want to answer. 
So the connections that I'm building, they open doors for future guests and it'll make this podcast better and better. I'm not Geraldo Rivera. I'm not here to ask the tough questions. I've been told, and this isn't directed at one, two, three people. I've received a lot of feedback. I get a lot of messages, but I've been told that the questions asked to Ali were not interesting or not as interesting as the Sienna ones. But my vision is to have a conversation with these wrestlers, not just sit there and rattle off a bunch of questions in a Q&A format. Because to me, that's that's super boring. Like, I conduct an interview, and it's a free-flowing conversation. I have my bullet points. It's, it's kind of like a promo. I have my bullet points of what I want to talk about. But if we don't get to that, we don't get to that. I'm not just going to cut off a nice conversation and be like, so tell me when you started wrestling. You know, I'm just not going to do that. It's not a Q&A session. And... You know, the last point I want to make here, Chris Jericho did an interview with Dean Ambrose several years ago. The entire interview was about Bigfoot or the Yeti or something like that or UFOs. The entire the entire interview wasn't about wrestling, not even a little bit. So if I were to conduct that kind of interview, I get it. I understand it. That's not interesting. That's not what you want to hear from someone. But I like to think that I stay within the realms of what's relevant to a wrestler and his or her character so i hope that makes sense i think the bar was set really really high with sienna because she answered a lot of questions that people really want to know with the backstage dealings of gfw but ali is very specific saying i'm not going to talk about that so i hope this makes some sense to you guys and you can keep that in mind going forward so now that we're all done with that guest host today row the great we're going to talk some destination x you know in every show Every, every set of tapings is going to feel a little bit like a reboot because a lot of people give them a hard time. Well, it's always rebooting. It's They do block tapings, and I, I use a lot of military references when I was in, but there was a period of time where I was an instructor, and we, did, um, we used to instruct a 16-day course for troops before they uh, basically went off to war. It was, it was like a uh, it was combat training. And every time we were done with a block uh, you know, our 16 day course, we sat down and said, okay, what can we do better? What can we, you know, what was, what was done well? And then when we had the next group, we, we, it was, uh, you know, we made all the adjustments and we watch a tape show and we don't realize they, well, they can't make adjustments on the fly. So it's going to feel like it's a little bit of a reboot every time, which is, uh, okay for me, but it's something that I'm not so sure people fully understand. The ropes are green. I was almost positive they were going to be green. Uh, excuse me? This was a pretty good crowd. I was I was told it was a few hundred more than it, it typically is in the impact zone. But this is what happens when you create must-see television. So a lot of people will say, oh, well, they can't fill the impact zone. If you watch the pay-per-views, Slammiversary, Bound for Glory, they can obviously fill the impact zone. The problem is, is that they something they have to work on is they they have not done a good job of creating must-see television and they don't have a good communication with the crowd inside the impact zone so you know i I know this from being in there say that uh so destination x was over and then they recorded the next episode aside from the gauntlet the crowd doesn't know what to look forward to you know we might from home be like oh my gosh they're gonna do this and this and this because we see the mat the match card announced the crowd doesn't know that so the crowd is not giving it a reason okay uh i gotta make sure i come back tomorrow for this it's just uh it's a problem with taped broadcasts and they gotta create must see tv but you know just to use another military reference because this is going to be this is the best we're going to get from the impact zone so so good or bad this is not a shot at them i thought the crowd did a good job this show. There were still the people in the front row leaning on the rails. I'm sure you saw that too. <laughs> um, but overall, this is the best we're going to get from them. And to use you know another military reference here before we get into the show, you know I'm an Air Force guy. We're largely regarded as the least motivated branch of the military. So you could put a hundred Air Force guys in a room, and 20 Army guys or 20 Marines are going to be a lot louder than the 100 Air Force people. That's It's just how they're wired compared to how we're wired. So as far as that impact zone, that's just that's just the best you're going to get from them audio-wise probably. you know. And that's not a knock on them at all. I thought they sounded good, but if you're expecting the loud pops and all that crazy, it's just probably not going to happen. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, too, one point I'll make, I think, moving forward, because this is one uh, minor gripe that I have. I think 
as far as uh, making it must see. You know, when they're advertising these matches and stuff, the booking of who they ha- who they're involving, I think, has a lot to do with it. Because I know for me, like I loved how they, you know, with the partnerships that they have with Crash and AAA and and uh, Noah. But I'm always feeling like, OK, when they advertise, you know, say like Laredo Kid and Garza Jr. versus, you know, some uh, mainstay tag team. Like a lot of times I'm feeling like, OK, well, the mainstay is going to win. Like they got to. You know, some of these matches that they're advertising and even title matches as a fan, I want to be able to look forward to like, hey, who's going to win? You know, this it could be either or I got to catch this, you know, versus all right, well, you already know such and such is going to retain and stuff like that. So I think that's one thing they have to do. when They're putting together these cards, putting together matches where, you know, as a fan, you know, you don't know who's going to win. So you're compelled to want to see the outcome. Right. So if you compare it with Ring of Honor, for instance. Which Ring of Honor, <laughs> from from my experience, the, the Japanese guys usually win. But for the most part, if you if you see okay, it's me Tanahashi versus Jay Lethal. I'm just throwing two names out there. You're kind of like, oh man, that's gonna be a badass match. You don't really see it as, uh, oh well, Jay Lethal is gonna win this because he's the Ring of Honor, the Ring of Honor guy. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So if somebody's gonna come in, we want him to have a puncher's chance of actually winning and you know Marufuji was my number one example where I thought he just with the exception of one match aside from Slammiversary just thought he looked so weak every time they booked him and you know so but let's get into uh Destination X so I know you read the 411 Mania reviews like I do because I think they typically do a very good job they they rated this show a 5.5 and um while the what he didn't say anything that was Outside the realm of, you know, I mean, it, he made very good points, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I thought he, I thought it was still very overanalyzed. And I, I think he was foreshadowing way too much as far as uh, future booking and everything. Instead of just in, kind of enjoying the show for what it was. Uh, but I don't know. We're always going to think different things. Some people are going like, to like episodes that other people hate. But I think this was universally a really good episode, probably their best episode of the year. So if you're talking a 5.5, that's that's pretty low because I think that's like his second lowest rating of the year. And there's been way worse shows than this. Yeah, I mean, you know what? The thing with that, like I'll look at it from time to time because I think for the most part uh, on there, the, the guy who um, does the reviews, for the most part, he's fair. You know, there's going to be some reviews where – you know, shows that he reviews that he reviews high that I, you know, probably won't review as high. So, you know, we agree to disagree. But I always just kind of look at it as I think maybe there's a standard that he has. And I think he measures each, you know, promotion to that standard. You know what I mean? Because the one thing that just stuck out for me when he said rely on old names and stuff like that, I was just like, well, gee, that's the pot calling the kettle black much, ain't it? Because I know other promotions who do the same damn thing, you know, but it's okay when they do it. So I just think as a fan, you know, you read some of the points and stuff. It's like, okay, I see where you're coming from. But at the end of the day, you know, you make your own decision. Like to me, the show, I gave it a good seven, you know, like it, it was good for me. It was a good all around solid show. I thought so. it was about a 7.5 for me. This was the most, and I usually base my personal ratings off how engaged I was into the show where I wasn't on my phone tweeting or anything like that. Like this one I was really, really, really into. So so the opening match here, I'm going to need your assistance a little bit because I showed up about 25 minutes. Uh, I was at, a, at a, something from with my kid's school. Showed up about 25 minutes late and we uh, we swapped out DVR boxes last week and that uh it wasn't programmed to record <laughs> so i uh i missed the first 25 i saw highlights of the uh, knockouts match and that was about it so i'm gonna rely on you a little bit for this one but it's the knockouts title match which was champion sienna with km versus gail kim now what i've seen with the highlights was that i mean it seemed like the match was it had some really good action and some really good uh moments and it looked like they got a little bit you know, more time than some of the knockouts matches have been getting before. And we talked about 411 Mania. He mentioned the distraction with KM. And he, he has a point there. Uh, Sienna's been getting a lot of wins off distractions. However, 
maybe, you know, I talked about overanalyzing. Maybe I'm looking into it too much. I think that they're going somewhere with that. You know, that's it's been very obvious that KM or Laurel or something has been helping her win in her matches. I personally think they're going somewhere with that. You know, a lot of people are, oh, I'm tired of the distractions. At the same time, she's a heel. She has a heel on the outside. Why would they not try to distract? That's kind of their job. But um, for you watching the entire match, what were you thinking of this one? Nice back and forth. I mean, there was moments where, like, Gail might pull up the upset. But um, I think the biggest takeaway was we saw the return of uh, Taryn Terrell. And, you know, for people unfamiliar with her, she's with the company a couple years ago. But, you know, with her returning, um, especially with the few departures that, you know, we had in the knockouts division, um, that helps because uh, she's a good worker. Um, she's relatively, you know, still young. So, so she can help the knockouts division, you know, fill the void that uh, there is with some of the departures. But it's a great match, and I'm, I'm glad to see Sienna retain. I was uh, people always ask me what who I want to see come back to the company, and I don't give a shit about too many of the guys because most of the time when they depart, it's not you know they take their parting shots on the way out the door, and the knockouts tend to leave the company with a little bit more dignity, a little more class, and uh, Terrence Terrell was always the return that I wanted to see, and I had said it back when Brooke came back and then kind of fizzled out real fast and didn't stay with the company. I said I wouldn't be surprised if they reach out to Terrence because. They're obviously trying to find someone from that era to come in and work with the younger girls who they bring in. Angelina Love came after that, and that didn't last too long. She pretty much came for the uh, storyline angle, and then she left. I don't think she felt like there was much for her, so I had said it again. I wouldn't be surprised if they reach out to Taryn Terrell, and she just got back on Twitter the other day. And, of course, the one match that I miss, the one match I've missed all year, is when Taryn makes her return this was my only thing about the return is i thought it was so it was very lackluster in the way that it was done that it didn't really get much i i don't want to say it didn't get a crowd reaction because if you listen to the crowd there was it was loud enough for this angle but you didn't visually see people really jumping up and down and maybe you know taryn's a heel so i mean do you jump up and down for heels and they make the return i don't know but you know the same people were leaning on the on the guard rails up on the front and um you know they don't really have the long ramp that you run down and you know you know it's like wwe has a very uh they have a different um platform to work with people running all the way down or running through the crowd or something like that Imp- impact zone's not really formatted like that so she came up through the non-camera side and i don't even know that people knew who she was necessarily uh i don't know if maybe they didn't recognize her or she didn't really you know play it up to the crowd or anything she was very laid back as she got in the ring was kind of doing her sultry dancing you know it wasn't it wasn't really high intensity stuff but I mean what do you think about the connection between her and the crowd do you um um I thought you know what same thing like you were saying um maybe they didn't recognize her like I like to believe um you know during her time with the company and stuff I mean, I'm sure there's still some of the fans that follow the product now. We're still watching, but maybe it was a different set of fans too. You know, maybe those ones, you know, the ones who are familiar with her, you know, maybe they're not around anymore. So her running in, you know, the people at the show probably didn't recognize her. So I think moving forward, what GFW needs to do is maybe, you know, do a, a better job of re- reintroducing her to the fans. So the fans who might have forgotten who she was you know, know who she is and the ones, you know, who don't know who she was, you know, is, um, you know, they know. I think she's the biggest name they could have brought back to the division at this point, uh, maybe outside of Awesome Kong, but, you know, they try to bring Brooke back. Angelina had her quick run, but those weren't, uh, you know, big headlines. And uh, bringing Taryn Terrell back is actually a much bigger deal than any of them, in my opinion. Let me ask you, though, um, Do you worry, though, that the same thing, because they all got something in common. They're all parents. And um, we've seen with Brooke, 
I mean, to a lesser extent, Angelina, but I know with Taryn, Taryn's a parent too. Do you feel like this will be more of a short run? Because it seems like, you know, I mean, it's understandable, but it seems like, you know, these knockouts that return that, you know, have, you know, have families and stuff like that, they're not there for the long, the long term, you know, it's usually like a short run. Yeah, I can't help but think that if they sat down with Taryn and said, hey, we're interested in bringing you back, that they didn't. Uh, make this a big point of a uh, topic when they were sitting down and doing negotiations. I'm sure they said, Hey, Brooke, Brooke stuck around for two cups of coffee and left my personal opinion on Brooke. And I could be in left field, but I think when the new management came over and the contracts were a little bit structured differently, because the rumor is with Brandy, even though I, I fully believe the company just didn't want Brandy. But mm -hmm. with that being said, the rumor is that, well, they wanted a, a percentage of her outside, which we, we get. We've talked about the 10% thing, and that's not a bad thing. And we try to explain to people this is why they do it. But if it's something that has nothing to do with wrestling, I can see where that might rub somebody the wrong way. Um, I think it makes sense if it's outside of wrestling, if, if it's a gig that the company helped someone land. You know, so like if mm -hmm. EC3 got his acting gig and so, oh, well, Impact, you know, the officials made this happen for him. I can I, I can see that, but if if there's outside gigs that they're getting on their own that have nothing to do with their wrestling status, I can see where that causes an issue. And I feel like Brooke has a lot going on outside as well, and I think that's where there was a disconnect. That's just my personal opinion, but I, I can't help but think when they sat down with Taryn, they said, "Hey, we're we're building up to Bound for Glory. It's a new era in the you know, new age in the company. This is our concerns, you know." I, I would hope that they wouldn't bring her back for that just to happen again. And they've been pretty lenient in letting people out of their contracts like they did with Tyrus. But, you know, I'm going to, I think I'm going to do a separate vlog on this later, but I think they're letting go of the people that they truly don't have anything for, or the people that they say, okay, Dixie brought this person on and uh, they don't fit our vision. So if they ask to go, we're not really going to put up a fight. Yeah, that's yeah. and that's what I that's what I kind of see with with some of these like Brandy case in point. So, you know, I think they had no desire to use her, but she also is gonna you know she's also posed to have a much bigger role uh, in a program with Gail Kim. And I think what's good with her Gail Kim is I don't know how you feel about it. every time Gail Kim, Kim gets a title shot, people are like, oh my god, what does she do to deserve, deserve it this time? Or we're getting another Gail Kim in the title picture. Now we get a angle with Gail Kim that's with Taryn and has nothing to do with the knockout title. It's it's off to the side. So I think that's really interesting and I think it'll make people like Gail Kim a little bit more because usually Gail Kim is very popular until she starts getting into that title picture when it's undeserved. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you. And I, I even think too, she's at, at the point now, like, you know, she can feud with Taryn for a minute, but she's at that point now where she can help, you know, elevate and develop, you know, some of the newer knockouts where, you know, you, you know, she works with them for a little while, you know, and preps them up where they're ready for, you know, the title picture and stuff. So I'm all on board for that. If it's keeping her out of the, keeping Gail out of the title picture. The next segment is Bruce Pritchard coming out, and he is to dis he is to make an announcement regarding the future of the GFW Global Championship. They also teased that he was going to make a he was going to address the Tyra situation, which didn't happen. I think that uh, Bruce, uh, excuse me, I think that Jim Cornette, who came out, I think he inadvertently took a shot at the situation, and uh, we'll get to that in a second if I remember. But at first, he had said that the title was uh he he now i missed i missed the very first part here but i would imagine he had said that alberto relinquished the title did he say that uh he said that he he actually called him by his real name which i thought like was like what the hell but um he was saying that he had been stripped and uh you know, it was just talking about that he hopes that he gets the help that he needs to take care of his issues with his family but yeah it blew me away he's all like El Patron, whose real name is Jose Rodriguez. I was just I'm like, I didn't know that was necessary, but okay. He future endeavored him, which uh, was not Yeah, you know that. what? I, I heard that, and that threw me off because I was like, I didn't know when they uh, originally announced, you know, the strip of the title and him being suspended indefinitely. I didn't hear anything about a release, but hey, you know, we'll see. 
So first, Bruce Pritchard had said it, it's going to return back to its rightful owner, which was Lashley. Lashley's music hits and out comes Jim Cornette. What were your thoughts about Jim Cornette coming out and returning? Uh, and before we go to you, I know the rumor came out during the day. Someone said, do you want Jim Cornette to come back? I, or is he coming back? I said, I hope not, because he, he has said a lot of negative things. Now, do I put him in like the Meltzer category? No. I mean, Jim Cornette doesn't like any current wrestling. So it's, and I don't listen to him on a regular basis, but I have heard him say that much. So, you know, if I'm misquoting, I'm sorry, but from what I'm understanding, he's not a big fan of the current product period, um, across any company. So, but I, I, God, I mean, what can I say? I didn't think he was going to return. I thought it was a, a completely far-fetched rumor, but what were your thoughts about him coming out? Um, you know, yeah, first and foremost, I was just thinking, I'm like, you know, it's funny, you know, he put out that video not too long ago where he felt, you know, the changes with the new ownership that, uh, you know, the company couldn't be salvaged. But then it's one of those things where, you know, you're critical of something. All right. If you're that critical, why don't we bring you in and let's see what you can do. Let's see if you can change it. Um, the thing I like about bringing him on. I feel like he has a good ear for what the fans want. And that's, you know, we've all been talking about, like, you know, we want to see some of the homegrown talent that GFW has be elevated and developed and stuff. We don't want, like, we don't mind, you know, the new additions, you know, from the outside coming in, but, you know, make them work their way to the top. We don't want them etched in the main event right away and, you know, taking a spot from somebody who's been busting their butt waiting for that, you know, opportunity. So I think with him, I don't know what his uh, contract status is as far as with the company, if it's a, you know, he's going to work, you know, certain certain dates or whatever like that. But um, I'm sure that vision will be passed along through him. And you're right. I think he has an ear to the streets much beyond what Bruce has. And uh, I think he's. I think he is going to be working in an advisor role. And uh, it's. It's. He said some good things. People aren't just going to come in here and waltz in and get in the title picture. And you know that's basically what El Patron did. And yeah. you know, from he had an interview after the show, and he he said that the company professionally contacted him and said, "Okay, if you can do better, come do better." You know, he said it was it was said very professionally. Of course, you know those weren't the exact words, but he was basically challenged, and he's up to the challenge. There was confusion on his status with the company due to that interview. But I've also watched his backstage interview that he did on the YouTube channel, on the Impact YouTube channel, and he always says, "I'm I'm not a member of the roster. I don't have a horse in the race. I don't care who wins, who loses." I'm here for corporate. So people took that at first, like, okay, he's just here short term. I don't think he's here short term necessarily. I think he's without overkill is going to be there when the company needs him as a character. And uh, just, you just got to listen to his interview. It's, it's between it's in the middle of a work and a shoot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you, you just got to take what he says with a grain of salt, but I, I do expect him um to kind of be around long term, I just don't think you know necessarily every set of tapings he's going to show up, or he's not necessarily going to have to stick around for the entire time. But he says I'll be as around as long as they need something fixed. So I do take that as a, a storyline comment because it makes no sense to bring him in just to replace him again, especially if they're replacing him with like a returning Bruce or something like that. That's like the worst thing they can do. Yeah, exactly. And it seemed a lot, like a lot of people were willing to give the, the product another shot now that he was on it. You know, he retweeted a lot of stuff that night. So if you go through his Twitter feed and he's well, he's doing one thing that Bruce never did and he's already promoting the company. Yeah, you see, that that's the problem that I would have with Bruce and stuff. It was that, that the fact that all the TV time that he was getting and stuff and then I never heard or I never heard his podcast, but I, you know, would hear that uh, he never really mentioned anything about the company and stuff like that. But um, like I said, as far as with the TV time, what used to kill me was you see him in a backstage segment, you see him come out and address a wrestler, you'd see him as a judge for the uh, grand uh, uh, championship matches. Then, like, say, if, you know, when they're having uh, the split aparts, you know, you'd see him come down there. It's like, that's too much Bruce on my TV screen, you know? So. <laughs> 
But uh, yeah, I already like the addition of Cornette, and uh, let's just hope you know everything goes upward with the company coming from going from here. Yeah, him and Bruce are night and day, so I'm actually pretty excited that I, I believe he's not on the next episode, but uh, I know he's he's used forward. He has a Titan Tron entrance and all that. So Super X Cup Tournament final match: Desmond Xavier versus Ishimori. We talked about the uh, 411 Mania review being pretty uh, pretty poor on this show, and this was one of the ones that they were pretty down on. And this was, damn, I thought this was like the best match of the Super X Cup, and I, I thought all the matches were pretty good. I was I was probably the most invested in this one as far as, uh, I won't say my favorite wrestler or wrestlers from the tournament were in this match necessarily, but I was I was on on the edge of my seat for it. I was enjoying it. I wasn't getting on online. I wasn't getting on Twitter. I was really enjoying uh, what they were doing. So Super X Cup final match. What'd you think? Um, I liked it. It was a uh, back and forth. I always love a match where I don't know who's gonna win. There's really like no definitive. Like okay, this guy has it. If I had one gripe, I would just say I just didn't like how the ending laid out. Like, you know, you had Xavier kick out of uh, Ishimori's 450. Okay, then Xavier hits a series of kicks, and then that was the end of the match. I would have liked to see Ishimori kick out of that, and then, you know, there, then, you know, there's one big move that happens that decides the match. I just kind of just felt like they didn't they didn't protect Ishimori's finisher and then they they let you know Desmond win with a move that wasn't even cuz he uses the spinal spiral tap as right. his finisher but um outside of that it it was good um i hope Ishimori sticks around cuz i agree on the lines of what Josh said you know the Xavier and Ishimori they're the future of the X division you know, future faces of the X Division. So I think, you know, having these guys around long term, especially with Ishimori and stuff, they can do some great things and give us some great matches. After the X Division match, we uh, get another X Division match, and it's the X Division title ladder match, Sanjay versus Trevor Lee. We had talked on the GFW Amps review that that was probably the best Sanjay has really looked. I mean, he that, that reminded us what Sanjay can really do. And I thought this was a good... I want to call it almost a classic ladder match because they didn't do, and, and maybe I think we've been conditioned so much with all the ridiculous ladder spots that we see in professional wrestling that that's what's necessary for a good ladder match. And the first ladder match ever, which was like the Razor and Sean, it wasn't about spots. You know, they used the ladder as a weapon, but the goal was to climb the ladder and get the championship, not to set up 50 ladders and jump off the top rope and spin and go through them all and <laughs> you know so th this was a little more like classic to me in that sense and i think to maybe to some people they'd be like oh this wasn't a good ladder match but i thought they captured the essence of what a ladder match really was do you uh, agree with that at all or do you think that they needed some little more drama with this and you, they needed the high spots no, I, I felt that the, the layout of it was fine. Um, you know, with the high spots and all that stuff, I always just feel like you don't I don't want to see that in every match. There's some matches where it's necessary where like I wouldn't say this was like a blood feud. But I mean, it was, you know, a heated feud because you got Trevor Lee. He steals the X Division uh, championship. And Sanjay, he's not even allowed to come inside the impact zone to try to get his belt back. So, you know, you had you know, a rivalry there and stuff, but it, it, it was great for what it was. And uh, um, I was surprised with the winner because I actually thought Trevor Lee was going to um, actually win. But, you know, I'm, I'm cool with Sanjay retaining the championship. Um, I'd be interested to see, you know, where both these guys go from here. What do you think about the new X Division title belt? I think out of all the belts, this one, like, stands out the most. And... I think that's good because ever since, you know, the new regime took apart, I do feel like the X Division has been, you know, has benefited the most. You know, there's been more focus on the X Division. We're getting more one-on-one -on -one X Division matches as opposed to the, you know, thrown together multi-man matches. But um, the title, all the titles, I mean, they're fine in my opinion, but uh, the X Division belt is the one for me that stands out the most. I like them all. I always thought the GFW designs were really sharp. And uh, that X Division one is really nice. And 
I, I didn't like the old one, the green one. I really didn't like it at all. I thought it was actually really ugly. So I think this is a, a huge step up. And you're right, they've been putting a lot of focus on the X Division, and they've been putting the right kind of people in the division. So, you know, Desmond Xavier, two years ago, we would have never got a guy like that in the X Division. They've been, you know, Dixie, towards the end, she was really trying to push, and uh, even though Braxton Sutter's my guy, they were trying to push Braxton, Braxton Sutter as an X Division guy, they're trying to push Marche Rocket, another one who I love very much, you know, try to push him as an X Division guy. And try to oh well it's no limits you know it's you know Samoa Joe did it so Marche Rocket can do it you know they just try to push something on us that wasn't super believable it was, was kind of like hey here's a makeshift X division we're just gonna quick quickly throw together call it the X division uh, give you matches that are shorter than a knockouts matches and here you're gonna like it so they're <laughs> focusing on it the right way they're putting the right guys in it I mean if you go from top to bottom. With with Sanjay, uh, I don't know if you want to still consider low key or not, but we'll say low key. Matt Seidel, uh, Trevor Lee, and then you you throw in uh, Andrew Everett, and you still got Caleb Collin. I mean, you you could go, you know, Desmond Xavier. Of course, you can go six seven down, and it's it's a really nice X division style. Um, during this match, Sanjay wins it, but uh. Caleb Conley comes out. So I didn't – Josh said something about Caleb Conley and Trevor Lee were forming an alliance or something like that, that they said it earlier in the night. And then I was told maybe it was something that happened on Facebook Live or something. But did you hear anything about that? Nah, I didn't know anything about it until he announced it on a commentary. But, hey, anything to get Caleb Conley on the TV screen. I, I like the guy's work and stuff like that. So I was just happy to see him on TV. He's really good. We needed another heel in the X Division very badly. He slides pretty effortlessly over into that position because he wasn't really doing much in the division. So I think it works. You know, um, I'm a big fan of his as well. I've, uh, that was the last shirt I got on Pro Wrestling Tees. So uh, shout out to Caleb Conley. But um, it was good to see him doing something. I forgot exactly what it was. I think you might have put him through a table or something like that, because I think they had tables in there. If I don't, if I uh, remember correctly, and then PD Williams comes out and you know hits a Canadian destroyer. I don't know that you know we talked about with Taryn Terrell. I don't know that the people there knew who he was. You know Taryn Terrell, even if you kind of know who she is, you look at her and she she's got a pretty distinct look, and she's, I mean, really she's probably the best looking knockout they've ever had in my opinion so she's kind of more easily recognizable pd williams doesn't stand out like that i don't know that the people knew who he was necessarily i would have probably popped a little bit more for the canadian destroyer than they appear to you know and again when someone makes a debut or a return you don't necessarily have to be jumping up and down in your seat but you can have a look of interest on your face and i don't i don't know that these people necessarily knew who he was yeah, it's crazy, man, because I think back when I first seen uh, the Canadian Destroyer back in, like, the mid-thousands and stuff. Like, that was one of those moves we all jumped up for. Like, it was kind of, like, similar to, um, you know, I used to be a big uh, Billy Kidman fan, you know, back in the late WCW days. And when he would do the shooting star press, you know, we'd pop for it. I think what's happened is, um, you know, you've seen, you know, wrestling evolve where, you know, a shooting star press. Um, I've seen so many people do the Canadian Destroyer now where, you know, some of these fans, maybe they've seen other wrestlers use that move. So it's not that big, big of a deal and stuff. And, you know, same thing, you know, maybe they're not familiar with Petey Williams. So that's why when you're having some of these returns and stuff, you know, maybe right after, you know, have a backstage interview to reintroduce the fan fans to these wrestlers, you know, give them a little backstory or whatever like that, what they used to do and stuff. But uh, that was just the one thing that stuck out to me. I just said, wow, you know, five years ago, the Canadian Destroyer was getting a mean old pop. Like now these people feel like, oh, I seen such and such do that off the turnbook or something like that. It's It seems like it's not a big deal to a lot of people nowadays. That's well said. Uh, there's some, there's a couple things I missed here. I'm a bad host and I'm sorry. Sorry to the listeners. Uh, so we're going to rewind here a little bit. We got so caught up in what we thought Cornette was going to be in the company that we really, uh, 
I completely skipped over what his big announcement was. So he fires Bruce, and which was, to me, I think everyone wanted to see Bruce get fired, but at the same time, his role was so undefined, and it wasn't like he was coming and ruining the main event every week and everything like they acted like he was just this huge disruption to the company you know like he they really didn't do a good job painting that picture but he fires them which we're all down for and announces a 20-man gauntlet for next week and i think that should be a lot of fun because we're probably going to see some debuts some returns and maybe some faces we haven't seen in a little while i know when Bram sent out a tweet the other day, someone said, I hope you're in Orlando this week, and he hit like on it. And usually, usually they kind of let us know with little things like that. So maybe we'll see a Bram. But what do you think about this announcement? And um, you think it's a uh, must see television? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, you know, first one with the whole stripping of the GFW championship of El Patron and stuff, and then to not have a world title match at Destination X, you know, it's kind of uh, disappointing. But um, I feel next week's uh, impact is going to be must see just because we're going to be crowning a new GFW champion. And um, my only thing though was where I kind of felt bad, and I compare this to a situation where um, I don't know if you remember a couple years ago. But uh, MVP was actually slated to win the championship. I forgot who the champion was at the time, but he got injured. So then the title shot went to Lashley, and, you know, Lashley ended up becoming champion. So you know, and that's how the whole Lashley dominance was started. But um, I just feel bad because we don't know, we'll never know what the plans were with you know, the outcome as far as Loki versus El Patron. I'm a believer that Loki would have defeated El Patron for the GFW championship. So now being placed, and I know uh, Cornette offered him the 20th spot, the last spot in the gauntlet for gold. But you just, you just hate to see a guy's opportunity, um, you know, potentially, you know, be missed because of something out of his control. So I just hope moving forward that they do they still keep Loki in the main event picture just because I think that's a new addition and it's fresh and it's showing the elevation of talent. I mean, he's done everything he could in the X division. It's time to move him up on the card. Yeah, he's won the title like nine times, whatever. So uh what is he, a five time X division champion. I mean there, there's nothing else he can do in that division. He won it his first night back in the company. So I think keeping him in the main title or the uh main event picture going forward is smart. Especially lining him with LAX. I mean, it should be very seamless to just uh, throw him in that role. But it was good that LAX came out. And it was good for the storyline, you know. Someone came out and said, hey, well, we deserve... Uh, Loki deserves, you know, to be to be champion, basically. And, uh, you know, they were going to do that for him. But they said, hey, we'll be fair and give you the 20th spot. So that's where Cornette said, I don't have a horse in the race. I don't care who wins or loses. So it sounds like he's going to come out and be a very fair, fair authority figure. So... You know, sometimes he might favor the heels, sometimes he might favor the baby faces, but we want something very realistic, and it seems like he's going to play a very realistic role. And I think that the gauntlet's going to be really entertaining because, for the you know lack of lack of argument, sake of argument, I should say, it's like a Royal Rumble, and usually the gauntlets are always you know seven, eight people. It's nothing nothing crazy, but to actually do a twenty man gauntlet that should take a you know probably have to show up. Uh, or good portion of the show, I should say. I think it's going to be really enjoyable. I think it's going to be some must-see stuff. Another thing that I I missed on, and it's because I didn't hear it at all on TV, so I uh, completely missed it in my notes. But during the Super X Cup, they announced the global the uh, global wrestling network was coming. What do you want to see from this? Because here's here's my personal opinion on it, real quick, before I get into what I want to see. I don't. I think if they just rely on the TNA library, I don't think that's going to get get the subscriptions or the uh, downloads or however they do this service. I don't think it's gonna. They're they're gonna get what they want based off the library alone. I think it kind of worked with the UK for a little time because they needed it to watch Impact, but I don't think you can just bank on the YouTube content they've been doing, you know, maybe uploading it early on there. You can't bank on that in the TNA library. That's not going to that's not going to get you what you need. And this has an opportunity to be a pretty big revenue source if done the right way. So, what do you want to see from it? Um, just give me something that 
I can't see anywhere else. Like I would just say, you know, if they're going to do, you know, with all the, uh, the, uh, uh, partnerships that they have with these different promotions, you know, maybe air, you know, some of their content, um, you know, I don't mind the old TNA library, but just don't rely on it. And the main, the main thing for me is to be different from, don't try to be like the network. I feel like if they, if that's their goal, like, Hey, we need to keep on par with what they're doing. And you know, the content that they're putting, we need to put some everything. I feel like it's going to fail. Like, you know, dare to be different, you know, give us different content where I don't know if they announced a, a price tag and stuff, but just, let's just say hypothetical, you know, they're going to charge, you know, make it worth whatever the fee is for, for the fans and stuff where they're feeling like, okay, you know, there's enough content to, you know, keep me, you know, you know, from, you know, continued paying what I'm paying and stuff. So just, you know what, just, uh, um, something different pretty much. I think six ninety nine will be a very fair price tag. Um, I don't, I don't think making it, I don't think making it close to the WWE one would be smart because they have infinitely more content on there and, but it's, it's more quality over content. I mean, it's, there, there's a lot of stuff when I had the WWE network that I would, I had no interest in whatsoever. And there was a lot that I did have interest in, but it's, it's not, it is quality over quantity, but I still wouldn't put the price tag up to where theirs is. I think it has to be a little bit more affordable than that. And I don't know if the official name has come out, but it looks like they're calling it the global wrestling network from what I'm understanding. It's not the global force network. It's global wrestling. So I'm just going to assume I'm going to use common sense that they're going to utilize these partnerships in the best way possible to, I don't know, you know, what kind of written agreements they can enter into. You know, they probably can't tap into their libraries necessarily, but you know, episodes and shows going forward or maybe matches if, you know, okay, Eddie Edwards is in Japan. So we're going to upload that match to the network. And I think it's going to be, it's going to be something that other companies are going to say, okay, I want to get involved with this, especially some of these smaller indie companies. So, okay, if I, if I kind of partner with these guys, you know, how can they get some of our stuff up on their network? You know, and it's, it becomes a, uh, teamwork, which what pro wrestling should be, not a monopoly. And I think that they can be the ones to spearhead that, you know, we all need to work together. And it seems like everyone is there right now. Ring of Honor is still doing their own thing, but it seems like now with, you know, Lucha kind of working with GFW a little bit. And then, you know, we got Crash, Lucha, Noah, you know, it seems, it seems like ROH and New Japan still doing their own thing a little bit, but they're, they're doing pretty well. But I think this has the opportunity to be big, but like you said, dare to be different. We get the debut of Jake Chris and Dave Chris, which is OVE, Ohio versus everything, versus Jason Cade and Zachary Wentz. I don't know what you know about these uh, opponents of theirs. Jason Cade, he wrestles, uh, my brother was saying he wrestled in, uh, uh, damn, I forgot what the, what it was in, in California, the real the real big show. But he uh, he wrestles here locally too in Illinois. I know he lives in Florida, but a uh, pro wrestling gorilla I meant to say. But um, Jason Cade wrestles here. I've seen him a few times. Zachary Wentz, I believe, is kind of part of OVE stable in the Indies. If I'm uh, not totally mistaken, this was a really weird squash match. I don't even you can't even call it a squash match because it was a uh, a competitive two minutes and. Zachary Wentz attacks at the bell and hits a flying knee on uh, one of the Chris brothers. So, real strange. What'd you think about this? Um, you know, for me, as far as with OVE, I mean, I, 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 it's just a small sample size because it's their debut. But, you know, so many kicks, man. I mean, it kind of reminded me, and um, I'm sorry if I offend anyone, but when I first seen a Nakamura match, because, you know, I had been told, you know, how great he was. And I just seen him do a whole bunch of strikes and stuff. And I'm kind of a move guy. I like seeing, you know, a mixture. Like, the kicks are the, and strikes are cool, but I like seeing some moves. And just in this match, I felt like every other move was some kind of super kick, some strike and stuff. And it's like, you know, but, hey, debut match, it's all right. I mean, I don't take a whole lot away. I think, uh, to, uh, excuse me, take a whole lot out of it. It just is more as just an introduction to the fans of, who OVE is. Yeah, 
they really this was a debut that was probably more hyped up than most debuts. You know, they don't they don't usually when they debut someone they try to find some creative storyline way to do it. But this is this is the one time in a little while they're like, okay, these guys are debuting, get ready for this. And the other team got in a lot of offense, and not just offense like a couple punches and kicks, like they were hitting some high impact stuff. So it was almost like Cade and Wentz were a team as well on the exactly. uh, GFW roster, and uh, I would imagine they're probably not. So this was, it was just weird. Um, it looks like they were booked as baby faces because they came down slapping hands, and I think the tag division really needs another heel team, and maybe they're gonna rely on you know Congo Kong and KM or something like that. Maybe they're gonna put a makeshift team together, but really LAX is all that's going on for the heels. And uh, they then they need something else. <laughs> so yeah, I, I was do. actually really surprised these guys came down slapping hands. I don't think they're going to remain baby faces too long. But there was uh, a little Twitter. I'm going to call it a little Twitter backlash because it wasn't like it was a whole bunch of people saying that OVE was a knockoff of the Wyatt family. <laughs> Let's come on. I think I think uh, later in the shows they kind of wear masks that are similar to the goat mask, but I I think they're more devil. But I, I I don't. I guess you could see see some similarities in a sense. But when you see these guys come down, they're almost more, you know, they're almost more devilish. You know, so you you can say maybe there's some some comparisons, but I don't. The well, OVE that... OVE wins though, don't they? Is it, wouldn't that be the difference between the two? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm just asking, you know, I, I don't keep up. That would be the difference. I mean, when you're comparing, you know, oh, this is knockoff. I'm looking at it like overall, not just the attire, but do they win? You know, do are they getting job? Like, I mean, from what I've seen, OVE won this match. So, I mean, I don't see how they're a knockoff, but hey, you know, to each his own. Next up was the most confusing part of the evening for me. So, Cornette is walking around with the championship, and this is where people are walking up saying, hey, I want to be involved in this. Why of all people, Eli Drake and Moose walk up. I'm sorry, not Eli Drake. EC3 and Moose walk up together like they're homies, and they're just like, we need to talk to you. Like, did we just forget that these fools were just feuding over this title? Moose just lost his title to this guy, and they just walked up together like, Hey, we need to get in this. Okay, you guys are in it. Okay, cool. And then they kind of like walk off together. Like that didn't you know, strike you as weird? Yeah, I wonder though, do you think maybe they turned him face because of the Al Patron situation? Because at first what I was thinking, I said, you know what? We forget, you know, these guys do so many, uh, you know, sets of tapings, record so many sets of tapings. You know, maybe they, you know, forget, you know, what's what and stuff. But uh, I was thinking, I said, you know, for them to do that, I said, maybe they turn, you know, are turning EC3 back face and just, you know, kind of like a, the, without announcing it, because, you know, now they don't have no main event faces. If you look at it, you know, if I'm just throwing out a main event picture to you, you know, Loki, Hill, Eli Drake, Hill, Lashley, I know he's in between, but he leans more to the Hill side. There's really not a whole lot of, of faces and stuff like that. So maybe they're change turning him face i mean i don't know we'll have to that remains to be seen but uh no i agree i was just like hold on you guys you know moose especially you just kind of essentially got screwed out of your championship you're over here you know mucking it up with ec3 but whatever <laughs> <laughs> it just i i kept i just sat there staring more attentively at this at this than anything on the entire show because i was like show me something that makes sense here so that was really just very strange uh you you might have a point, but I think we don't want to see EC3 go back to babyface because he's starting to finally fall into his niche. But yeah, you're right. I mean, we don't really have anyone on that side, uh, on the babyface side. You know, Eddie Edwards. I mean, he hasn't really been around and and uh, hasn't really been in the main event scene a whole lot since winning. Um, you got Moose. He can be in that. He can. Um, they'll probably. You know, he's had the Grand Championship for so long. I'm sure they're going to elevate him a little bit. You got James Storm who can who can fill that. But, I mean, his time with the company is probably running short. I forget. You're not – you're not – you're not – you weren't much of a fan of the EC3 original face run, huh? No, I wasn't. I, <laughs> I still love EC3, but 
he just got he 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 started kind of getting that corny John Cena babyface stuff going, and I don't know, yeah, I it wasn't working I, for me. I agree. I I just thought, of, and you know what? I didn't even look at it like that, and that's true because I've seen some elements of that, you know, later on in his face run. But I just kind of just thought, I'm like, he could pull it off, but he needed that that counterpart. Like I thought, I always thought. You know, the vision was like he would have been the top face and like say if Eli Drake was the top heel, you can have those guys feuding for, you know, essentially forever. And, you know, folks will eat it up and stuff like that. But he during his face run, he never had that heel counterpart, someone he can look eye to eye outside of what Lashley. And, you know, they wrestled so much where it's just like, OK, all right, enough. So I, I get you, though. Yeah, he didn't he didn't have the yin to his gang at all. And. Uh, but another name. That could, uh, uh, well, without, before I get to that, um, Eli Drake and Adonis came up and, uh, he gave Eli Drake number one. I wish he would have given Adonis number one so he'd be eliminated quickest, but Eli Drake's going to come in at the number one spot next week. Loki's going to be number 20 and we'll see what happens in between. So the main event of the evening is, uh, Lashley versus Matt Seidel. So Matt, my, Matt Seidel is another guy that might, you know, might, uh, step into that main event role we will see but uh i thought this match was fine i I will say i was not totally paying attention all the way through i i maybe i was just uh preoccupied with something but i thought the match was fine i i did think that this whole america's top team i call them team america fuck yeah but uh (laughs) America's top team. I was pretty sure that this whole time it was some kind of angle, but it seems like what Jeff and Dutch are trying to do, and even even with the El Patron situation earlier where they stripped him of the title, I feel like they're trying to tie real life into pro- professional wrestling a little bit and make those angles. And I think that's that's what a lot of the most popular characters have been, and you know, in professional wrestling history, you know, had had a touch of realism to them. I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to figure out how do we make, uh, how do we cross over real life and fantasy and make it a really believable product. So while I do think that there is some people at America's top team that want them to fight full time, I also think it's also kind of angle kind of storyline. And I think it's something to get Lashley off TV for a little bit too. And it makes sense. And it's, it's time for him to fight again, but I just fully expected, expected Matt Seidel to win this, so I guess that's maybe why I wasn't super invested in it. What were your thoughts on the main event? Um, you know, the one thing I thought, and why I give Lashley credit, you know, the booking of Lashley has been incredible, where even in a loss, you know, he looks good, but he really made uh, Seidel look really good. Like, you know, because a lot of times when we see, you know, a heavyweight, or, you know, super heavyweights, you know, face uh, X Division or Cruiserweight guys, you really don't see them uh, be able to uh, execute their uh, moves, you know, as clean as uh, Seidel was to Lashley, like the Ranas and stuff like that. But um, it was a good good match. Um, Of course, you know, you had, you know, the little guy. It was like a David Goliath. But um, I think the ending, if they wanted to continue this feud – um, you have you can continue it because that roll up and you know one can debate that you know Lashley's shoulder wasn't on the ground. Um, it leaves the door open to continue the feud should they decide to continue the feud. But I like the match. Um, my figure Saito was gonna win too, just like everybody else did. But uh, it was good. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the uh, the roll up win. And uh, with that being said, I'm not. A, I I don't like distraction finishes, but. I don't mind them when because, you know, someone like Sienna is a heel. So if they have someone at ringside, that person should be trying to help them get the advantage. That's kind of what heels do. But what I don't like is roll-up finishes like those. That's it's just very unbelievable to me. You know, I guess I guess it worked in this. It worked here because I think he missed a a spear in the corner, and then he got rolled up. So you know, I, I guess it kind of made sense. A distraction roll-up is the one I think is super dumb, but. Fortunately, we don't see that on impact very often. But uh, 
So Matt Seidel wins. We don't really know what he's doing. I, I highly doubt if he beat Bobby Lashley that he's going to go one-on-one with Sanjay for the uh, X Division title. I, I just don't see that. I don't know. We're going to have to see what happens with the uh, gauntlet for gold because I think he's going to save that title opportunity to uh you know for the world title that's just that's just my assumption so but Lashley loses this everyone's everyone's disgusted everyone's pissed off from America's top team fuck yeah and uh Dan Lambert is attack he attacks I forgot which referee it was but he I think it was uh was it Hebner or Stifler I don't I don't remember who the ref was but I think Stifler okay he uh he starts getting choked and he he had a pretty good choke on him too like that wasn't some you know that wasn't like uh the Steiner recliner choke you know or you know like uh, Josh Matthews put on the loose ass Steiner recliner that my grandma <laughs> could get out of you know like this was this was a choke he he locked that thing on him pretty good so you know it's an angle and I think it's it's interesting because Lashley for the better part of the last year, year and a half, has just been that dominant champion, and he's just steamrolling everybody, and he's... you got to add a different wrinkle to this. And I think this is something that you're able to focus on him not necessarily being in the title picture for a little bit because you're wondering what's going on with this. So I thought it was really well done. After this, we get a video package for Johnny Impact. What do you think about the name? They could have done better than that, but I mean, hey, you know what? I'm happy to have them aboard and stuff. But uh, yeah, the name, man. It. <laughs> I had tweeted. I said, when I think of Johnny Impact, I think of um, you think of uh, any professional uh, sports team, and uh, they have the mascots that shoot out the the cannon shirt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was just thinking. Like Johnny Impact. Like if you had a team named Impact something. Here's Johnny Impact coming out, you know, trying to get the fans engaged. But hey, you know what? He's coming it's not out so much. <laughs> He's coming um, out half time to do to do dunks off the trampoline. <laughs> right. But I'll tell you what. Just like with, you know, I know there's some people who didn't like the titles. With his name, I don't care. It's what he's what he's able to do with the company. And how to help the company. If he's over here, you know, putting on stellar matches, you know, with um opponents and stuff and you know it's showing in the viewership you know johnny impact whatever you want to name him fine you know that's just my thing and how he's utilizing how he's willing to help the company grow i just hope what they do and i had tweeted this as well if he's committed long term i'd like to see him get the build kind of um how christian cage got with in tna where he came aboard but they took their time to build him to make him one of their own before they gave him, you know, the title shots and whatnot. So that's my thing. But I'm happy to see him on my TV screen again. Yeah, that's the key. I don't care who comes over from WWE and if they eventually are the, the champion. It's, it's are they going to be pushed to the moon the minute they walk through the door? Sounds like Cornette's not going to allow that to happen, both in real life and on screen. But if you take the time, like you said, Christian Cage is a great example. Make them your own. You know, you have an opportunity to do that with my, Matt Seidel a little bit, even though he's pretty far from removed from his WWE days. But that's what killed uh, Aaron Rex. And if you look back at Aaron Rex's debut, his, you know, when he when he was introduced, I mean, how could you not think, oh my God, we have a baby face star in the making? And the first few episodes, he felt pretty important. He was the he was a special referee for the Galloway and EC3 match. He felt really really important in that. And then all of a sudden they, they said, okay, well, we're going to put the grand championship on him. You know, if he had, if he had lost last year, Bound for Glory, and Eddie Edwards was the grand champion, we might be watching Aaron Rex on our TV today and in the world title picture. You know, he was he, actually, he was even in the uh, the uh, cage match. It was a four and four. The uh, They did a six, side of st- six sides of steel match. So, I mean, they were using him as a main eventer for a while, and it was working. But then they said, okay, we got a popular guy here. Let's put the title on him real quick. And boom, destroyed all momentum that he had. And then they couldn't even fix him. Yeah. So they just got to be really careful with that. And I think Johnny Impact is a good addition. I think he's someone that people are going to come see. And I think it was a... I'm happy to have him aboard. I really am. I don't care if he's freaking Johnny Sixpack. 
Johnny couch cushion, like whatever. He's here. Cool. Let's kick some ass. You know, he and he's a guy that can be in that world title scene as well. They just gotta pump the slow, you know, pump the brakes a little bit. Don't don't just throw him in there right away. But he's someone that could definitely run with it. So uh, that is gonna do it for the King of the Mound podcast this week, Destination X review. And uh, this was a good show. So if you read uh, 411 Mania and they give you a, give it a 5.5 rating, that's that's bullshit. I thought this was a uh, an outstanding show. I thought it was the best show of the year by a, by a long shot. And maybe it didn't have one of those standout matches that you're writing home about, but it was extremely solid up and down. I thought the OVE debut was the blemish. And then I think what killed it a little bit when you're talking about PD Williams and Taryn Terrell coming in is that they both they both did run-ins. You know, it, it was the same same type of re-debut. So you know, I wish uh, I wish they found a way to to get one of those over and introduce reintroduce a different way, but they did it the way they wanted to do it, so that's fine. I think uh, next week's gonna be a lot of fun. Gauntlet of gold, can't gauntlet four gold, can't miss that, and that is it. So for Row the Great, this is BQ. Thanks for listening to the King of the Mountain podcast. We'll catch you guys soon. Peace. <laughs>